When I did my video on the Audacity telemetry situation, I talked about a concept known as vendoring, and when I was talking about it, I sort of assumed that everyone watching the video already knew what vendoring actually was, but after the video came out, I noticed I had a few comments being completely confused about the concept and why it was a bad thing. Now, I went and explained to these people individually, but I assumed that maybe other people don't know what it is, and maybe it deserves an actual video, so that's what we're talking about today. In absolute simplest terms, it's a way to make sure the application's dependencies are always going to be available by just shipping them with the application. So let's say you want to go and make a cookbook application, for example, and you need a string parsing library known as Bob's String Parsing Library. Now, to make sure users of this application actually have this dependency installed, there's two ways we can go and do this. Firstly, we can go and have the user download the dependency and install it system-wide. So anything else on their system that needs Bob's string parsing library can also go and use that version, and it ends up having less duplicated code. The other way you can do this, though, is you can go and take the source code for the library and just stick it in the repo for the application. So when someone goes and downloads this application, regardless of whether they actually have the dependency installed on their system or not, they will still get a copy of it. So consider this to basically be the opposite of doing package management or dependency management, and instead having the developer of the application handle all of this manually. Now, while this does make package management way more complicated than it actually needs to be, it does serve a very useful purpose. So let's say that your application relies on an 11-line JavaScript file, and that JavaScript file is just removed from NPM. Now, this is actually something that did happen. So a couple of years back, an application known as left pad was removed from npm and basically broke most of the packages. If this file instead existed locally in the repo, this problem wouldn't exist. While including this locally would lead to a lot more duplicated code, in the case of an 11 line file, it's not really that big of a deal. If you're vendoring something like say Python though, which is a massive massive project, it is a very different situation. Another reason to vendor is it completely bypasses the problem of having outdated dependencies. So let's say that your program relies on Python 3.1 and no other version of Python will work because whatever specific feature it needs is removed between those versions. Well, let's say that you go and put Python in your repo. Well, now you don't have to worry about this because the version of Python you're using has been frozen in time and until you go and update it, the application will continue to work as long as that dependency actually runs on the user's system. Or let's say your application relies on a fork of one of its dependencies that is different from the version that people typically run. One good example of this is the Termite Terminal, which while being a VTE-based terminal, isn't using the same version of VTE that things like the GNOME terminal use, it instead uses VTE-NG. Now, in the case of VTE-NG, it wasn't actually being vendored, even though vendoring something like that would be perfectly normal and make a lot of sense. What it was actually doing was having that in a separate repo, and then when you installed Termite, you would go and download VTE-NG alongside of it and install it like any other sort of dependency on your system. The advantage of doing it like this is that VTNG added in a lot of useful features that other VTE developers would want to have access to, allowing them to also use this modified version. An example of this actually being vended is when you go and download an EA game. So in that case, they actually maintain a modified version of the C++ library because the default version isn't really suitable for game development and they wanted to make it so it actually worked for what they were doing. And that takes us into another point about vendoring where it's really, really useful. And that is vendoring on the development side because you want to make sure that all of your developers know exactly what they're supposed to be developing against to make sure the application actually works in the way it should. If your application relies on Python 3.1, all of your developers should be running the exact same version so they know exactly what they're actually allowed to use. In a lot of cases though, you can just rely on dependency management and say, okay, as long as you have a version of Python between 3.1 and 3.6, it's gonna have everything we need to use, pick a version in that and it's gonna be fine. One example from my life is when I was doing my VR development course, I needed to use a version of Unity between I think 20, 18 and 2020 and anything in that range is going to have everything we need all of the libraries you need are going to be available in the package manager 
Just pick a version, doesn't matter what you use, as long as it's one of those. Now, this is going to be especially true for cross-platform development, but in a lot of cases, you may need to access a library that, while it does run on Windows, Mac OS, and Linux, isn't easily accessible in all of those operating systems. Usually, it'll be fine to access on Linux, but there's no easy way to get it installed on Windows because maybe there's not a binary available and you need to install it from source code and it's not available in things like Chocolatey and just getting your hands on it just is a massive pain. And this is why Audacity goes and vendors a lot of its dependencies because while it's easy enough to get access to those on Linux, in a lot of cases, things like FFmpeg are just available in the standard repos. On the Windows and Mac OS side though, it's not as straightforward of a process to actually get your hands on them. Now, in the case of modern web development, vendoring is not just common practice, it's basically standard practice on both the development side and also the deployment side as well. Usually when you install a dependency for your project, you're going to install it to the project's repo and just have the source code located there. Now, in a lot of cases, there is another way to access these dependencies, and that is through a CDN link. So, what this basically does is when a user loads up the website, it will then go and download that library from a separate server. The problem with doing this, though, is if the CDN link isn't working, well, now they can't access that code and your website completely breaks. Also, this may lead to your website loading much slower because if you have a bunch of CDN links, it's going to have to connect to a bunch of different servers before the site can even begin loading properly. I do think there is a time and a place for using a CDN link, but I don't think I'd be comfortable using them in a production build. In the case of development, though, it's free real estate. I think the reason why this practice is so different on the web is because you can look at each individual tab in your web browser as their own encapsulated little operating system with all of the dependencies needed for that tab just installed to that tab. Now, I went over a lot of advantages of vendoring, but that doesn't mean that it's perfect for every single situation. It does have some pretty big drawbacks as well. One of those drawbacks is when you vendor code, you take on the vulnerabilities of that repo. So let's say that someone goes and reports a problem with SSL and you have OpenSSL vendored in your project. Well, what's going to happen is that's going to be fixed in the OpenSSL repo and users can go and update the dependency on their system, but you still have an application installed that has that vulnerability. And that vulnerability won't be fixed until the developers of the application go and update their vended version. So users of the application have to trust the developers are actually updating their vended code. And in the case of SSL or really anything related to the internet, that could be a pretty big problem to worry about. It can also lead to applications being far larger than they need to be. Now, in the case of that 11 line JavaScript file, obviously not that big of a deal. It'll add a couple of bytes to the project. But what about OpenSSL? What about Python? What about FFmpeg? What about curl? All of these things will make the project way bigger than needs to be. Also, you have the obvious problem that if the user needs this dependency for another application, well, now they have two versions installed. And if they install another application that vendors it, now they have three versions and four and so on and so forth. And the more applications that actually vendor these dependencies, the more copies you have on your system. Which links back to the other problems where you may have these vulnerabilities and you just don't know about them because all of this code is being vended. While the problem can very easily be spotted for something open source, if the application is proprietary or just not source available, well, now there's no way you can really tell and you have to trust the developers to actually be doing their jobs properly. While unnecessary vendoring is certainly a problem and is absolutely frowned upon, the concept of vendoring itself is not inherently bad. Do you know what is inherently bad though? The Segway. Linode on the other hand, they're pretty cool. If it runs on Linux, you can run it on Linode. They have the distros you'd expect available like Ubuntu and Debian, but also Arch and Gentoo because why not? They've got multiple server plans available, so whether you want to host a blog or even a personal VPN, there'll be one that fits you. I'll be using Linode to host all my community game nights. If you need help, Linode has 24-7, 365 support available by phone, regardless of your plan size. Right now, you guys can get started on Linode with $100 credit by going to the link on screen or in the description down below. Linode was in the game three years before Amazon entered cloud computing, so you know they know their stuff. A huge thank you to Linode for sponsoring the channel. So I think that's going to be everything for me. Let me know your thoughts on all of this in the comment section down below. So before I go, I would like to thank my supporters. So a special thank you to 
Joachim, Donald, Logan, Michael, Andre, Nathan, David, Carl, Will, Brennan, Chico, Bento, Jamie, Joseph, Josh, Mitchell, Peter, the 70s, through Tony Tushar, and all of my two dollar supporters. If you'd like to go and support, work the links down below to my Patreon, subscribe, start, leave pay, all that sort of stuff. I've got my podcast, Tech Over T, available basically anywhere, and I also live stream some games over on Brody Robertson. Brody Robertson plays over on Brody Robertson plays on Twitch and YouTube. Also, if you want to watch this content on a platform that isn't YouTube, it's also available over on Odyssey. So I think that's pretty much everything for me, and I'm out. <laughs>